I'm sorry we had some technical difficulties to start with, but I trust that the sound is okay now and that we can pick up on, on where I left off. I'm going to recommence because I'm not sure how much of my introduction got through to you. Um, thank you very much for joining me on this particular session to do with sustainable cities and, and human rights. Uh, the MOOC seems to be going extremely well, judging by the, the volume of communications that, that exist and the quality of the people involved. I trust that you're finding it very useful. It's a fantastic uh, uh, environment, of course, to be able to, to interact with, with people across a wide range of areas. Um, I want to just briefly start by introducing myself and explaining my own take on why I think cities are such an important place in the context of human rights and why it is that human rights perhaps provides important uh, and an important agenda that, that anyone interested in cities needs to engage with. Uh, my own experience, I'm currently a professor of law and dean of the School of Law at Middlesex and also dean of the business school at Middlesex University in London. But I, I grew up in Mumbai, Bombay, uh, as it then was. And in the context of my, the start of my career, I worked as a journalist uh, for Indian Express newspapers at a really interesting time. It was this time in the early 1990s when the Indian economy was opening up. I guess opening up towards the kind of direction that it is in now. Um, and the cities were booming, but cities had always been booming. They acted as magnets to attract people who were trying to escape what was becoming grinding poverty and still is grinding poverty in rural areas. And the cities acted as something of a magnet. So populations flowed in uh, unchecked, unlike in, in China, of course, where you've got a huku system which prevents uh, flows of population. In India at that time and still now, populations flowed into cities like Mumbai and most people came looking for a better, better livelihood. But in the context of that journey to a better livelihood, which of course many attained and many failed in, uh, there were a number of hiccups. And I think these are the kinds of hiccups that need to be pay, att pay attention to if we're going to get the social dimension correct in the context of cities of the future. Um, and so a human rights approach what can it do for cities? First of all, a human rights approach would emphasize the fact that you need to worry about the entirety of the population in a city and not just those who have. So you would need to worry about the inherent dignity and worth of every individual who was living in that particular environment. And that presents a major challenge because cities almost by definition have become places where enterprise thrives, uh, and so the argument could be, well, if you want to thrive in a city, you need to create a level playing field, but then it's up to individual enterprise. Those who are more enterprising, perhaps, will find a better livelihood and success. Those who are less enterprising might not be as successful, and as a consequence, will have to live with the fact that they're not enterprising. But of course, a human rights approach would dictate that we still need to find the wherewithal, the platform by which that enterprise can thrive, irrespective of a person's personal identity, for instance, gender, uh, ethnic allegiance, uh, ethnic identity, religious affiliation, uh, linguistic abilities, all of these need to be put into a mix. Let's just ask the question, well, what happens if we don't worry about human rights in the context of a city? And I think this is, again, an important uh, point to, to understand what it is that human rights can provide. So let's assume a city where essentially it, it is a place that uh, enterprise thrives. Populations are attracted to cities because they feel that this might be a way out in terms of creating a livelihood for themselves, but some succeed and some fail. If you don't have a human rights approach, you're going to have cities that are divided in terms of winners and losers. Now, every city in the world, as far as I can tell, already has this mechanism inbuilt. The question really is to what extent is the hand that you're dealt with, your personal identity, how much is that a factor? in you being able to, to, to survive, in your, you being able to thrive. I think that's the central challenge that we face because inevitably cities are going to attract a range of populations, not just from the majority ethnic group, but from a range of different ethnic groups. They're going to bring a range of different skill sets and they're going to be involved in the production, the co-production and the consumption of a variety of different goods, services and, and a whole range of other activities that take place that might not be commercially oriented. A human rights approach in that context is, is an attempt to create a level playing field by which the promise of equal inherent dignity and worth 
is maintained through the creation of a platform by which everybody can thrive. That doesn't mean that everybody will thrive. Personal enterprise will still be important. The extent to which people can uh, be creative, be energetic in pursuit of whatever it is that they want to do with their lives will still be fundamental. All we are arguing for is that there should be a lowest common denominator, a minimal standard below which nobody should fall. Now, what does that minimal standard mean? That minimal standard means, first of all, a basic uh, element of being able to provide healthcare, a basic understanding of the fact that people who enter cities need to address a range of challenges, need to find skill sets that are transferable, need to find employment that works, need to, need to find labor relations that make sense. If we don't, if we continue with business as usual, and we see these divides emerging, by which cities become those kind of wealthy zones, cities on a hill, so to speak, surrounded by vast amounts of countryside that essentially just provide labor, unskilled, low level, low paid labor to that city, inevitably you're going to face a security dilemma. So one very pragmatic reason for understanding what human rights can do in the context of cities is to accept the fact that a pragmatic approach requires you to make everybody who works within a city environment stakeholders in how that city functions. If they are not stakeholders, and if in, in, instead they begin to feel that because of, not because of who they are necessarily or what they can do, but because you class them to be part of a particular group, they're excluded, then those excluded populations become difficult because essentially they can be open to a whole range of ideologies that are not related to the sustainability of a city. Of course, at the worst case, that is terrorism. And this is something that we see spread across cities where we find excluded populations, the banlieue in, 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 in Paris, the slums in, in Rio. You find that if there, are, if there are populations and parts of cities where there are communities that live there that feel they will never have a stake in the city that's growing and thriving around them, they are likely to engage in what I often think of as the politics of desperation other people call terrorism. So you need to find a way to be able to bring those people within a fold. Human rights is not about giving people privileges where, where they aren't deserved necessarily. It's about providing the rudimentary services, the basics that will enable you to create a platform by which anybody who has the enterprise and, and, and the, the energy to be able to pursue something can do so. I think that's the challenge that's that the 21st century city provides us. Now, linked to that are a number of different issues to do with crime and safety, to do with healthcare provisions, to do with educational systems, to do with the extent to which the vast labor force or potential labor force that a city has is really geared up to address the labor shortages that might be in a city. And I think those are some of the challenges that, that we face and we have to bear in mind that what is transpiring today in the 21st century is relatively new, at least the scale and size of it is relatively new. We need to have a greater understanding of how it is that we can collectively overcome these kinds of challenges. And law in general plays an important role in maintaining order. But I think human rights does something in addition. It also worries about the justice element. And law always has this tension. On the one hand, law is there because you need order stability of possessions. You need things to work. And that's an important role of law too. But another role of law really is the idea that you need to create justice at the heart of it. And if you create a, a city-oriented societal justice, you're likely to have a more thriving and sustainable city. If you fail to do that, you're likely to have a city where populations feel excluded. They resort to desperate measures that might be blowing things up, that might be disrupting things, that might be sabotaging things on a grand scale designed to create terror, or they can be a relatively lower level sustained activity that's criminal. So whichever way you see it, if populations are excluded and don't feel part of what it is that's growing around them in terms of a city as a wealth production and wealth creation, creating machinery, you are inevitably going to create those schisms in society. And those schisms are very difficult to overcome. So that's just by way of explaining the context by, by which we need to understand what it is that human rights can provide in terms of the city's agenda. And there were a number of questions that were sent in to me that um, I, I might try to address. And I think there was a, 
a question, the, one of the first questions there. Uh, Carla, you said you are particularly interested in alternatives and inclusive approaches to the criminal criminal justice system. Do we have materials that we can read? I, I'm, I'm happy to put some materials with regards to criminal justice mechanisms uh, um, in, in the interface that you, you engage with. Uh, but yes, I think that is one of the major challenges. The extent to which we can think more creatively about criminal justice systems. If you look at criminal justice systems across the world in urban environments, you find that they are often overrepresented, particular communities are overrepresented. Those communities that are overrepresented in the criminal justice system are often underrepresented in the policing of them. So already you have criminal justice institutions that somehow feel other to the kinds of people that are in the criminal justice system. So you inevitably have a discrimination that occurs, whether that's a conscious discrimination or an unconscious discrimination is context based. But the fact is there's an optical vision of where you see the policeman or the, again, it would be a policeman rather than a policewoman. The policeman will be from a very specific dominant community and the victim, the, the criminal or the perceived or the alleged criminal will be very often from another community. And again, you see in our criminal justice systems, these schisms that exist. And inevitably, what that means is you have lives at uh, Black Lives Matter as a classic example. You have a, a, a scenario in American cities, and this is again, a key element all through raging through 2014 and especially in 2015 and 2016, these tensions coming to the fore in urban environments in the United States of America. If you have a police force that's largely white and male, and you have a population that's in, in the criminal justice system that's largely, well, in that case, black and male, well, you're going to have a difficulty. There's going to be a perception there. So rethinking a criminal justice system means rethinking not only the elements of what that justice system should be, but also the formation of it and the type of it and the, the population of it and the constitute constituents of it. Uh, there was a great forum that was conducted uh, a year and a half ago, and I can put the link again onto the, the interface um, under the United Nations. It's called the Minority Rights Forum. And in that particular Minority Rights Forum, this issue of criminal justice and minorities came to the forefront. And what you did see were reports widespread across the 190 odd countries in the world where people said, look, there is a real difficulty here in how we understand policing, especially policing in areas of that are high risk on crime. Um, there are a number of different alternatives and good practice models. I hope to be able to put some of those materials on for you to look at, but thank you for your question. Uh, Sirajul Islam, you've asked a question on, and I'm, I quote here, how can the framework of human rights and, and justice help plan our cities better? That was uh, my, my, my attempted introduction, which I hope was, was coherent enough, was an attempt to try and get to that particular question that you've posed there, uh, Sirajul. You say to plan our cities better, one could be to form and use existing local knowledge-based community structures. These should be city corporation spaces where city dwellers learn about human rights as relevant to their daily lives and concerns. And you say, uh, Sirajul, that by planning or doing this, people are likely to get highly motivated and, and form a sense of mission that are led by local groups and organizations concerned with economic, social justice and plan, reconstruct and advance their goals step-by-step step, guided by wisdom, norms, standards. This is very much the heart of what I was trying to argue in the, the, the sessions that you've hopefully witnessed and, and engaged with in the context of this, this MOOC. Uh, in a sense, if everybody within a city, first of all, feels part of one community, I don't necessarily mean one community in that you necessarily share the same ideas, but one community in that you are committed to making the place you live in a sustainable, thriving place where progress is possible, define progress in whichever way you would like to. But if you start with that particular platform and you understand that at the very basic level, every single dweller in that zone that you inhabit has equal dignity and worth, then you start interacting in a different way. This means that you need to treat the person that is cleaning your street with as much respect as you would somebody who's running the corporation that's employing the person to to clean that particular street and i think it's 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 a very basic human concept that actually if you understand and accept that you necessarily have to reject differences based on gender you necessarily have to reject differences based on ethnic linguistic religious identities you necessarily have to reject uh, questions based in terms of 
transgender and questions based in terms of sexual uh, sexual um, orientation as, as some as some would put it uh, sexual being as, as some others would put it so i think the question really becomes why are all of these things that differentiate us so inordinately important to the extent that we now have to discriminate in favor of one and against another so the human rights concept at the very, very basic level is trying to preach, and I guess it is a bit preachy in that sense, it's trying to preach this notion that who you are is, is not and should not be the consequence of what it is that you can do. If, if that is the case, then we are back to the law of the jungle. And if you happen to be born a, a lion or a tiger, well, good luck, your future is bright. But if you happen to be born uh, way down the food chain, well, tough luck then, that's not going to be the case for you. You're going to have a life full of, fill, filled with poverty and you're going to have a life filled with, well, not poverty, but absolute insecurity. The idea that human rights is trying to build is that in the notion of an equal inherity and inherent dignity and worth lies the, the, the crux of why it is that society should treat each other better. So it's no more, no less than that. Religions have preached that over time. There's no religion that, that doesn't preach that kind of message. I guess what human rights tries to do is it tries to create a system through it. And it tries to create a system by which these values are enshrined in law and accessible. The enshrined in law bit, we've more or less got right. There are very few cities, city environments today where the, the law is at fault. What is at fault, however, is the implementation. We haven't quite understood how to transfer our um, de jure, we say in law, uh, in equality in law. We haven't quite understood how to transfer that concept of equality in law to equality in practice. So what is, what is lacking in the context of human rights in cities is not so much the belief and the awareness of equality. It's the mechanism, the process, the solutions that take that normative suggestion, if you like, or normative principle and turn it into something that's meaningful and can be accessed. That's where we are at. We had an implementation gap on this, not a conceptual gap. And that implementation gap has to be overcome if we're going to create the kinds of cities that will be sustainable and the kind of sentiment that you've expressed here, uh, Sirajul, which I, I, I completely agree with. Uh, Nisha, you, 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 I quote what, what you're saying there. You say, you appreciate the module of, of integrating and understanding the importance of human rights is essential to decision makers. But you say, what's wrong with having a healthy glass house next door to a slum? And this was the context that I referred to where I talk about the fact that having these great differences in wealth can be a source of tension. I think your point, Nisha, is, 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 is well made in that, of course, you can have that society can tolerate those degrees of inequality. It's, it's a question of what type of inequality it is, because inequalities that are essentially structural and based on family and based on a legacy and based on, uh, I guess, achievement in the past is, is one type of uh, inequality, which is very hard to penetrate. So that type of inequality then is structural. And it means that people outside that family structure, outside that ethnic group, outside that religious community will never be able to aspire for that glass house that you have in the middle of your slum. Well, as an inequality based on a meritocratic approach, Somebody who has been more energetic, more enterprising, has come up with something that it was an idea that everybody liked and bought into and wealth created in that way somehow feels less unjust because that's the kind of wealth that you feel, well, you know, what's stopping you from working hard and creating the kinds of the solutions that, that somebody else has created? If you can get to a, a scenario by which that kind of inequality comes out as a result of something that an individual may do, that seems to be less unpalatable than the inequality that is based on, uh, uh, I guess, historic discrimination and historic exploitation. Many of the landed gentry families in some of the biggest cities in the world come and have built their wealth through a degree of exploitation. Not all of them have, many of them have, as a consequence of which the only way in which that, that equality will be tolerable is if everyone else feels well, they too can through human enterprise acquire those skills, acquire that wealth, acquire those kinds of transferable assets. If on the other hand, that, that wealth has been created and, the, and society is structured in such a way that the wealth that they have will keep perpetrating more wealth for them and the rest of society doesn't have a stake in it, well, that's going to create resentment. 
So I think your point is well made about the fact that um, this is not human rights doesn't prescribe or human rights, even if it did prescribe, could never aspire for or never achieve the idea of absolute equality. We're not talking about a socialist communist type approach by we say by which we say equal e e that everybody gets paid the same irrespective of merit. We're not looking at those kinds of scenarios here. Human rights is not prescribing any of those kinds of things. Human rights is just saying, here's a minimal standard that anybody who wants to play ought to be able to access. After that, well, what you create with that, well, that's up to you. That's up to your enterprise. That's up to your initiative. And I think that's the central idea here. So in principle, there is nothing wrong, to go back to your question, with having a wealthy glass house next to uh, a slum. First of all, if that wealth, one of the questions in the context of that was be, how has that wealth been acquired? How has it been, been constructed? Has exploitation been involved in it? Because that would, that would certainly change the way in which people in the slum viewed the, the people in the glass house. But the other would be, to what extent could you say that other people living in the slum too could aspire to one day having a glass house? Because if they could aspire to it, then you're selling dreams. Then you're selling something that somebody can say, well, if I work hard and do A, B, and C, or if I come up with this particular solution, or if I find uh, an answer to the crippling transport problems we have that involves my enterprise, well, I might get wealthy. You want to be able to create that kind of energy. This isn't a, a vote against wealth, but this is an understanding of the extent to which that wealth can necessarily be a prospect, not necessarily a certainty, a prospect for the vast majority. If the vast majority of people in that slum feel, ah, look at this person, this is something to be admired. This person built this by themselves, and as a consequence, look at the life they live, then now that's a source of inspiration. If on the other hand, people in the slum feel, ah, this person has acquired the wealth on the back of my slave labor. This person has acquired the wealth by stealing my land. And now they have constructed this glass house in the middle of my slum. Now that's the, the feeling you're going to have there is very different. So I think that's the central idea I was trying to get to. get to, And I hope it answers that question. So you, you say in your question, isn't it an assumption that slum dwellers are always a source of crime and chaos? Uh, and you say pragmatically, yes, I understand it's a concern most homeowners would have. However, from a rights perspective, isn't that what we're trying to break down, preconceived notions? Absolutely agree with that. We are trying to break that down, but it's about the aspiration and the extent to which people feel that they too can play within the city and not are not excluded ab initio because of their personal identity or, or, or the fact that they are they're male or, or female. That, that's the central idea there. And I hope I've addressed that. Uh, there's another question that's just come in from, from Mahmoud. Mahmoud, you're, you're saying, or you've asked, how can the key opportunities for sustainable development, like locally focused integration and technologically driven stimulus, mobilize investment in gender equality transformation? GET, you use the, the, the acronym. Uh, again, another good question. And I think there isn't a theoretical answer to this. The answer to this question is very much context driven. It depends on what the opportunities are for sustainable development in any given city. It does depend on what is locally available. Uh, some indigenous communities, for instance, very far from cities usually, uh, some indigenous communities have particular irrigation forms that might be useful and need to be harnessed. And maybe those irrigation forms would work better in the kinds of cities where that are next to these indigenous communities than the exported or imported ones from elsewhere. So it's, a very, difficult, it's very difficult to give a general answer to this particular question because it does depend on a number of factors. But let's say you, you start off in terms of trying to get something that has, that achieves that gender equality transformation that, that clearly is the aspiration uh, beyond, uh, behind your question. You try to understand the extent to which women and men can play equally within that particular sphere. You try to understand what is the comparative advantage that that particular community, that particular group has what kind of pedigree do they have in terms of problem solving? And you try and engage them with the question. One of the general difficulties in terms of whether it's, it's an urban environment or a rural environment, one of the general concerns that exists is that policy is made over there by those people who are doing policy, and then the rest of the people are simply living their lives and are impacted by it. We don't have that symbiotic relationship between people who are engaged in the living of their lives engaged also in the policy making. So you have a disconnect between those who are making policy and very often those who are using it. 
And very often, because of the way in which jobs are given out in many urban environments, the kinds of people who end up making policy often, not always, of course, often come from a very particular background. So it's, it's, quite, no, it's quite common, for instance, to have people with quite a degree, high degree of wealth who perhaps have their own cars to drive to work designing a train system, which they're not likely to use. It's not that common necessarily across the, the world cities, especially as you get into the developing world, to have people who necessarily use those being key players in framing the policy. Why is it that? Why is that the case? That means that we're not really understanding the full genesis of the problem, but we are implementing a solution that is often derived from another setting. And those solutions rarely work. Oh, well, when they work, it's by chance. When they don't work, it's by a failure of design. So I think understanding how to design those processes better is key and learning from the examples and learning from good practice elsewhere is, is central because different, different cities are facing similar kinds of questions. How they are tackling these questions and how much success they are having in addressing those problems become fundamental. So for me, the answer to that particular question, and, and I think this is the, 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 the more general answer I would give to your question, would be inclusion. Greater inclusion is bound to help. Greater inclusion in terms of women and men in the context of gender equality is fundamental because women and men will use presumably whatever service it is uh, that you're particularly interested in, will presumably use that service to more or less the same degree. So understanding those perspectives and feeding them in would be important. And then understanding what it is that what value added it is that particular communities, local communities would have would be important. For instance, living in a city that's prone to flooding, well, if society, communities have lived on that flood plain for many years, they may well have local indigenous mechanisms on how to cope with it that may not be the same as the grand urban solution that's been brought in from elsewhere. So I think trying to get that synergy is, is important. That's a general answer. But probably the extent to which you can generalize, the starting point for me would be look at the composition of the people involved in designing that policy and overcome that implementation gap between those designing policy and those being subjected to it. If we can bring those two often disparate communities closer together, we are likely to come up with a better solution, not necessarily the perfect one, but a better solution than the ones we have already. There's a question then from Banglarka here, Banglarka, and Banglarka, you say a business too often undermines fundamental rights. For example, the corporate regime undermining the right to food. Do you have proposals to discontinue business as usual? This is a great question because in a sense, it's a question that we faced quite square on in the context of even agreeing the sustainable development goals. Uh, when we have often thought about economic development, we've often thought about it as a state-driven enterprise. In that state-driven enterprise, we felt that the state has the responsibility to generate the economic development, but it's corporations who will ultimately create the wherewithal to go ahead with it. And there's almost been this assumption that the state needs to create the economic policy and then the corporations are, in a sense, actors there. As we have seen economic development take place, however, we've seen a shrinking of the state. The state today has less by way of job opportunities. The state sector is shrinking, the private sector is growing. The extent to which the private sector and the corporate sector needs to be engaged with is important. Uh, in the human rights world, we had really uh, serious uh, mindset problems to overcome with this because corporations were often seen as people who violate rights, people who don't uphold rights. Yet it's corporations who are going to create the jobs in the city, cities that we're looking at. So how do you engage corporations in it? Now, the attempt to engage corporations in the human rights agenda has been fraught with difficulty. Uh, one of the approaches was, well, we will police corporations. We will create str strong norms. When corporations violate that norms, well, we'll sue them in court. We will, we will nail them in court. We will get them to pay for the damage they've created. Now, that has that created a great degree of antagonism between corporation and communities. Uh, it worked in some places. There are some remarkable cases that human rights lawyers have won against corporations, but they've been antagonistic. Then the other approach was, why don't we just tell corporations that if you're going to operate in a particular area, well, you need to worry about the healthcare and you need to worry about the security and you need to worry about all the other trappings that come from communities. And the corporation said, but why? We are engaged in the process of producing something, selling something, getting a, risking an investment to get a return. We're not a state. 
we shouldn't be responsible for the education mechanism. Now, that too makes sense. So how do you engage with corporations in this context? And I would say that the, the obvious answer to, where, to that exists is, 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 I guess, one of pragmatism. Corporations are going to be key actors in the future. They already are. Corporations are going to be, hopefully, the engine that drives the economy. Corporations are going to be the ones that create the, the opportunities for growth. They are going to be the ones that create the opportunities for jobs, and they are going to produce the products that we consume. We need to understand how it is that corporations themselves can take on the mantle of doing that in a sustainable and ethical manner. Now, the World Business Leaders Forum, the Global Compact, these are things that are uppermost in their minds. Uh, and I think at the highest level, there is real serious buy-in to the extent to which corporations should be human rights friendly actors. Again, the difficulty lies in implementation. And the difficulty lies in how do you scale something that you see at, at, at Unilever, for instance, with, with Paul Polman, who's a fantastic advocate of this approach. How do you scale that down to medium-sized enterprises? How do you scale that down to small business firms? How do you ensure that when a corporation operates in a city, while it may uphold the human rights of people around, that no human rights were violated in supply chain? These are challenges that many people are looking at at the moment. And I think that there will be significant improvement in that scale. Now, look, corporations will still get away with violating human rights in the same way that you might create a very robust law in terms of uh, the possession of goods, but crime will occur, theft will occur. So corporations will still get away from time to time. I think the key is to make sure that the environment they operate in is more friendly towards an understanding, a pragmatic understanding on the part of corporations in terms of why it is they need to, to respect human rights, but also a pragmatic understanding in terms of the population, in terms of what it is a corporation brings. And I think creating that symbiotic relationship is where we are at. And certainly, you will see this footprint across the SDGs, this attempt not to treat corporations as the evildoers, but this, this attempt really to, to understand what it is that corporations can do and to understand that corporations' primary motivation is profit. And that's acceptable because that profit motive, if it is framed in a manner that's genuinely inclusive, can be the source of providing the jobs that we need to, to be able to create sustainable cities. So I think that would be the, the, the challenge. The proposal to, be, to discontinue business as usual, I would, I would argue that that business as usual uh, has, has changed already. Corporations are very different beasts from the ones that they used to be, certainly in the colonial era. If you look back um, to, for instance, the growth of some of the oil companies in the colonial era and the way in which they behaved to how they behave now, uh, corporations are far more subject to environmental regulations than they ever were before. They are far more subject to human rights regulations, equality legislation, health and safety operatives, um, working conditions for staff. There is a slew of different regimes and, and legal principles that corporations have to obey in the 21st century that was simply not on the table in centuries past. So this is a, a, this is a, a, a steady improvement now. You might say, well, what about the sweatshops and what about the working conditions in various parts of the world? And I would say to you, well, we're finding out more about them. It's by no means, I don't want to paint a picture of it being a, a super duper future that's really optimistic and everything's working well. No. But what I am suggesting is that the direction of change and the extent to which corporations are being forced to answer for some of these questions is a good starting point. And I would say that I'm less worried about business as usual if we can maintain that particular pressure on that discussion. But if we treat corporations as potential violators or potential enemies, we're likely to miss an opportunity of working together beside them to change their behaviors and to shape the way in which their future policies will, will work. OK, Deepti Raj, you have a question. And you say, there are forums and institutions who work for human rights, but how effective are they at ground level? Well, I have a simple answer to that question, and the answer is not very. And then that they're not very effective at ground level. And again, I would say for the same reasons that I used before in the analogy of trying to understand how to design transport systems, that very often the people who are in these fora are well motivated, but not necessarily inclusive themselves. And that becomes a challenge. So policy is framed by people who have a skill in framing policy, don't necessarily have a skill 
in being able to operate under that particular policy. And, and so human rights forums and institutions are many, but the extent to which they can operate is, is flawed. It's deeply flawed because we are still only just emerging from a process by which we've begun to understand that human rights is really about some very creative solutions. Human rights has been for a long time about naming and shaming. Now, naming and shaming basically means that we will observe and when you behave badly, we will shout, we will challenge you and we will shame you into better behavior. That has a role. Sure, when there's injustice, it's important that somebody stands up and points out what that injustice is. But it's, it's equally important. And that's where the human rights community was really lagged behind. It's equally important that we understand the deficit in the behavior that we ought to see and the comparison between that and the behavior that we do see. So what we need are pragmatic solutions and not just the blame game. And I think sometimes, certainly in the human rights world, 30 years, even 20 years, possibly 15, 10 years ago even, we have seen a greater emphasis on the naming and shaming and a less emphasis on the design. So if you are trying to pick up a corporation, to go back to the previous question, and a corporation is, is committing human rights violations, you know, in a sense, yes, you can take them to court and make them pay. And that's one approach. And perhaps that has to happen depending on the scale of the violation. But there's another approach, which is that you understand and you try and through pragmatism explain to that corporation what it is doing that's wrong, why it's wrong, and more importantly, how it can continue doing what it hopes to achieve in a manner that doesn't violate the right. And that requires a creative engagement that we haven't always had. We haven't always had it because we haven't always been aware enough of models being tried. So we haven't necessarily been creative in trying to find solutions. And that's one major aspect to it. But the other is because it's always easy to do the withering critique. And I think that in a sense, our educational establishments are full of this. We teach people how to think critically and that's good. But if we don't also teach them how to think, think um, creatively, then all you've done is you've critiqued what exists. And you might feel smug about how good your criticism is. And you might feel extremely intelligent in how well you framed it. But the problem has remained. The person you've critiqued has felt that you don't respect them. You have antagonized them. And they have not felt that they need to solve your problem because they've ruled you out as a crank. So we need to take the critique that we have and to systematically understand how we can have creative solutions to our own critiques. We have an academia and, and uh, you know, in my profession, we are particularly guilty of this too. We have felt that as long as we critique society, our role has ended. We don't need, necessarily need to be engaged in pragmatic solutions. So we would do a critique in, in some of the disciplines in, in, in my school, for instance, criminology, uh, we would do a critique of the police and that's fine. And yes, we need to hi highlight if the police are behaving badly and they're victimizing a particular community, somebody needs to highlight that role. Academics play an important role in that. Uh, journalists play an important role, society, a, a larger society does, civil society organizations do. But what about somebody then to work with the police to try and fix those deficits? How do you fix those deficits? Where do you derive the solutions from? So that's an example of which it's easier to do the critique of what's operating than it is to say, well, yes, I've done the critique and it fails for A, B, C and D reasons. Why don't we try this particular solution from this particular area because that might well try and attack the problem at its root and i think that's our challenge and certainly a challenge for every one of the 17 goals cities or not will be the extent to which we come up with creative solutions we are all mostly aware of the critiques but we need to move that discussion one step forward to try and get to the solutions and this is the beauty of the the sustainable development solutions network that the sdsn is, which is, which is uh, again, something that's linked to the, uh, to the SDG Academy, is trying to understand where good practice occurs, understand the science of how that good practice has occurred, understand the design behind that good practice, understand the extent to which it needs to be scaled up and rethought about in different contexts. See, in, in my discipline in law, for instance, you would see that the vast majority of the world's legal systems derive from five, six legal systems already. Now, those five or six legal systems come usually from Europe, you might have some, some strands now from, this, from the United States of America and Canada, but of course the United States of America and Canada themselves have their legal systems greatly influenced by Europe. So you have these legal systems that grew up in a particular era 
in a particular context in Europe, yet there are 190 odd countries in the world that have echoes of these legal systems. Now, to what extent are the problems faced in those 190 odd countries similar or analogous to the problems that were faced in designing these legal systems here? We just haven't interrogated it enough. Yes, we can do a critique, we can label things as colonial, and lots of people get justifiably so very passionate about that particular process. But what about trying to find other solutions? What about trying to understand how those, how the mechanisms we have can be better designed to address the kinds of problems that exist in these, these places? And cities are a key focal point for that, because in cities, you see the need for policy fast, because cities change fast, because the imperative, uh, the policy imperative that you might have in a rural area is heightened in the city, because the challenges are heightened. And I think that would be a major aspect to it. So in the context of your question, Deepti, there and forums and institutions that work for human rights, how do you make them effective at ground level? Again, the answer comes back for me to participation. The extent to which you can get people to genuinely feel that these are their institutions and genuinely feel that they reflect an ideology that is commonly shared. And the ideology, remember, at the base of it is very simple. Just the fact that you need to, if you want to sign on to this, believe in the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. That's all. It's a very, very basic level. From that then flows the necessity of constructing a platform of rights that gives people, irrespective of where they are born and irrespective of the accident of birth, some shot at being able to play a meaningful role in modern 21st century society. So I guess to sum up, the key issue then that human rights can offer is to try and get us away from the accident of birth into an era by which actually what you, what you can do within a city or what you can achieve in a city is not just the result of the accident of birth. If you can come close to that in a city environment, then it necessarily means that you will have cities that are sustaining, you will have cities that thrive, you will have cities that are creative, you will have cities that are peaceful. And I think this becomes a major, major trend. And certainly in the context of the world since 2011 that we have seen and the, the, the heightened sense of injustice and the heightened sense of um, even since September 11th, if you go further back, the heightened sense of insecurity that exists. One way of combating them is to spend more in terms of uh, policing and more in terms of uh, eradication of, of security threats. The other is to just rethink the extent to which we create societies that are inclusive. If we can create societies that are inclusive, we are likely to get a far greater degree of security, I would argue, for a fraction of the price. And I think that's the key. Uh, there's probably time to address one final question, I think, and that's uh, from Harshil. Harshil, thank you for your question. How can people from different sections of society get to be a part of framing the human rights, framing human rights policies? Uh, first of all, let me just clarify in a sense. Human rights policies don't need to be framed constantly. Human rights policies, by and large, exist. They need to be modified and tapered. This isn't a process by which we, we constantly set out on an annual basis to redesign the wheel. You know, The wheel already exists. Society is already moving in a direction. It's more or less in line with human rights. What you need much more is a tiller, on, I guess, a hand on the tiller that, that steers it one way or another a little bit left, a little bit right, that steers a pathway through it. So in a sense, there isn't a role for a constant redesigning, but there is a role for an improvement. There is a role for, for amelioration. There is a role for making it more robust. And I would argue very, very strongly that the challenge in the 21st century is not about framing. It's about implementation. So your question, when you say, how can people from different sections of society get to be a part of framing human rights policies? I would say the bigger challenge is not that, but how can people from different sections of society get to be a part of implementing the human rights policies? And if you, if you allow that, that substitution of words, then the answer becomes fairly obvious. At a very basic level, understanding and respecting inherent dignity and worth is fundamental making that a part of your, your own individual human rights values, your own personal values is crucial. Trying to engender that, that element in the people around you is important. So that's the micro level personal realm, I guess. Then there's the professional level realm. And the professional level realm depends really on what it is, which sector of society you work in. If you work in a corporate sector, you need to understand the extent to which your company, your, 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 your institution that hires you understands the human rights imperative. 
and is ready to implement it. If you work in the, in the public sector, you need to ensure that your services that you offer are available without discrimination to anybody who walks through that door, because that's fundamental to upholding the inherent dignity and worth. And of course, there's a range of different, different aspects outside. There's a great opportunity for social enterprise in trying to understand how those implementation gaps can be filled. Uh, there's a great emphasis there in service provision, basic level service provision, basic level education, and the extent to which some of that can be done for commercial profit is, is, is not to be underestimated as well. So there's a range of different activities that can be engaged in that make that I would argue would make cities more sustainable places. And if we can engage in some of those and also understand that they need to feed into the, the framing process, the policy framing process, then we will be in a better place. I think that's uh, the questions that you had for me. Thank you very much for joining me in this session. Uh, thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties that uh, allowed me to speak, but not for you to listen, which of course was a major problem because you're here to, to tune into the conversation and not merely see a, a talking head on your screen. Uh, I trust that 2017 has started well for you. I trust that 2017 will give us a year where we will have greater harmony in our cities and globally. And I also hope that you will and that this particular MOOC has engaged you, has inspired you, and has really, I guess, um, energized you to take on the challenges that we face. The world in 2030 will not be a better place if we don't design it better. If we just allow business as usual to continue, and if we allow, um, I guess, existing policies to run their course, we will more or less stay where we are, possibly get worse. We may, by chance, hit on some improvements. If, on the other hand, we take these bits apart and understand what the underlying principles are and start designing things in a modern 21st century smart way, we are likely to get better solutions. I hope that you will, whatever you choose to do, engage in that particular process and it, that you'll make that quite an important part of what you do because we need your intellectual capacities, your creativities, and your personal experiences to feed in the process to come up with the solutions we don't yet have which is how do we make our cities of the 21st century sustainable and places that are thriving, energetic, driven places that respect the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. I do hope you enjoy the rest of the MOOC and thank you very much for joining me. And I will put some materials up on the usual interface in answer to some of these questions. Thank you.